I really take pride in the work that I do when it comes to reviewing speakers, and I wanna make sure that what I'm telling you guys is actually true, and that it's something that you can use to make a purchasing decision, or even if it's just gaining insight into acoustics or psychoacoustic theory. So in this video, Aaron from Aaron's Audio Corner and I were both looking at a speaker that we got sent in for review. In this case, it was a Cali Audio INUNF. I thought you guys might find it interesting to get some insight into the kind of things that we're considering, the things that we're thinking about, and the possible uh, ways that we could get the data wrong, or maybe the ways that maybe you guys could interpret the data incorrectly if we're not careful about how we say things and if we don't, you know, give you disclaimers and things like that. So anyway, I'll let you take a listen. It's a long one, but if you're interested in this stuff, I hope you find it interesting. It's very interesting speaker to say the least. So this one has caused me some headaches. Normally when I get a speaker, I measure on my clip old near field scanner and I get anechoic measurements and that's it. But with this particular speaker, as we'll get into in a little bit, there were some challenges there. So I will show some of the clipal anechoic results, but I need to preface it now with when you see those results, understand that those results are done in an environment where the speaker was not intended to be used. The speaker was intended to be placed on a desk and has some features built into it for that reason. And the anechoic measurements won't look ideal because of that. So, so what, what should we do for the person who uses those measurements and mm -hmm. they try to compare it with just a, an ordinary bookshelf speaker? So if you're that guy, don't do that with this particular speaker. And I've verified DDT? with... You think DDT yeah, would be good? Bam. So it just depends on the environment that you plan on placing the speaker in. And in this particular case, yeah, the speaker, the way I normally measure it is not really applicable. So... You've got to take the anechoic measurements with somewhat of a grain of salt. Now, the directivity stuff will certainly be helpful because it'll help you understand how much you can get away with equalization for the most part. But again, I just want to caution people that when you're looking at anechoic clipple measurements for this particular speaker, that the way this speaker was measured was not the way that it was intended to be used. With other speakers that you and I review, kind of like they don't know where it's going to go. You may put it at a desk. You may put it on some stands. You may put it on a bookshelf. It may be close to the wall. It may be pulled away right. from the wall. You don't know. Right. These are made specifically for a desk. They even have a piece mm -hmm. of paper that tells you how far apart to place things. Yeah. It's for a specific scenario. So when you take it away from that, it's not what it's used for. But I still found your measurements useful in helping me understand maybe the thought process behind why they did what they did. So sure. it's not that they're useless, but you just can't apply it the same way that you would typically apply these right. measurements. And again, right. if somebody wants to do that, they're going to mm, elbow from Aaron. <laughs> maybe not for me, but you'd be doing yourself a disservice. I, a lot of times what people will do is they'll take the anechoic measurements and they'll use that to help build an EQ profile to go ahead and clean up the frequency response issues that are in the speaker itself before they put it in the room. And then they have a good baseline to start with. If you were to do that with this speaker, you'd basically be working backwards because the way that was designed was to be uh, put on a desk. In situ. In, in situ, situ, I think is a very important thing to talk about. Right. What does that mean? Is that an engineering uh, that term? Is that, that a science term? I don't know what that is. I've read about it no, in, that, in, I mean, in some books. I'm in situ right now. I'm in situ. Right. In if, place. If I take a microphone and I measure the response at my head, based on the desk speakers, then I get an in situ response. It's basically just wherever you are, that's it. If I take your car speakers and I take mm -hmm. them somewhere else in the anechoic chamber or in a field and measure them, that's not in situ. No, in that's situ. not where you're using it. Yeah. All right. But if you play, if you take a measurement in the car, that would be. Yeah. I want to see some measurements. So what we're seeing right now is the speakers as they are on my desk, and this is how they're intended to be used. And if you look down here in the corner at me, wherever I am, there's this sheet that tells you how to set up the speakers. There's different dip switches that will, if you're going to put the speaker on a wall, or if you're going to put the base module standing up or whatever, you do that. And then there's this that tells you how far to put the satellite speakers away from the base module. The base module is the thing in the middle in this photograph. So I've set the speaker up per Cali's directions, and this is generally how it's supposed to be. And I say all that to show you, this is how I measured it anechoically. So this alone should really be all I need to say to caution people that the anechoic measurements that I'm about to show you 
are not necessarily idealistic, right? This Obviously, this speaker is not sitting on top of a desk, and there's that. And then this speaker is sitting on top of the base module and not to the side of the base module. Okay, this is a Spinorama data, and Joe had a suggestion of me throwing out some kind of red alert. <laughs> this is caution. Use at your own peril. Really, this is just done to give us an idea of the directivity of the particular speaker and the base unit together. Not so much to understand the linearity of the response, because again, for the 15th million time, I measured the speaker anechoically, not sitting on top of a desk, and it was designed to go on top of a desk. But the cool thing about this data is that it still gives us a really good idea of uh, where the crossover region can be, and more importantly to me, the directivity index. So if we look at the directivity index, as long as it's linear, it can be flat or it can be rising, but as long as it's linear, makes a line shape, then that means that the speaker can be EQ'd. For the most part, the speaker can be EQ'd, but we see a little bit of a dip around here. The reason that we had that dip is it looks like there's some sort of diffraction effect going on around 1.2 kilohertz. Now that could easily be the speaker module itself, I'll show this. Could be something to do with that, or it literally could be the fact that I had this speaker module sitting on top of the base bin. I just don't know. But then if you follow the data the rest of the way up, you see that it's generally pretty smooth. There is a diffraction effect here. That's from the coaxial drive unit itself. So the fact there. that it's an orb shape, how yeah. does that affect the directivity? So that's a good question. I'll be honest with you, I don't know if I could explain that in a succinct way. Mm -hmm. Like, Let is there anything here. here from these measurements that show like, oh, that's pr maybe because it's the orb shape or is no, it? No, I mean, so, so really it's just the raw driver. You don't have any, you don't have a baffle to influence the response of the speaker itself. And basically you can consider it a raw driver that's enclosed. And the enclosure part is going to have an effect on the lower frequency portion, but not on the, uh, the higher frequency portion. And so therefore I would say that in terms of diffraction, this is a clean design, or I should say directivity. It's a clean design because you don't have, you don't have like baffle step like you normally would. The speaker is playing, so it's its own baffle step essentially. You don't have diffraction effects from the edge of the baffle itself causing any kind of interference from the direct sound to the reflected sound. So, in all things considered, I think this is probably one of the best ways that you could actually design a speaker. And I've seen a lot of people go through a lot of trouble to put mid ranges in a round enclosure or tweeters in a round enclosure to minimize diffraction effects, which helps with directivity. So that, yeah, that's it for the anechoic measurements. I really don't wanna spend a lot of time on them because I don't want people to get fixated on them when we have our own in situ measurements. Well, what's the most obvious thing that people would point out as an issue here? And it may or may not be an issue, but the first thing that stood out to me was, what is this dip here? Right. Yeah. You know, oh, there's a dip there and there's a big old bump here around 100 hertz. Right. So those are yeah, the those... two things that'd be like, oh, immediately stand out. And let's see, are those real issues? Are... Yeah. Are they real problems when you put them on a desk? Right. And so That's really what we want to know. This is your estimated in-room response. Do you want to explain what that is? Yeah. Just really quickly, with anechoic data, as long as you have enough data points on axis and off axis, you measure the speaker all around. You can take the different angles and you can basically put them into a single profile that will give you an estimation of what you're going to hear in the room. And that estimation, in my experience, is pretty much always dead on above about maybe four to five hundred hertz. Below that is where the room is really driving what you're going to hear. But above that frequency is where the speaker is really driving what you're going to hear. So this is an estimated in-room response based on anechoic data. So this is how I had it set up. Ignore the speaker on the right. That's a different coaxial speaker. And I was using that to compare the two and see what effects were caused by the actual speaker itself. And so mm -hmm. it was a way for me to compare. So ignore that one for a second. But this is how I had it set up. And of course, when I was doing my testing, I had both of the Cali Audio speakers on the left and the right. Sure you uh, did. Believe me. Of course. Just believe me. Hey, man, Please believe me. What's interesting is the base module can be either stood up or laid down and they have two profiles for that. Mine was standing up as you can see. And I think on yours, it was laying down. Mine was laying down. Yeah. Okay. I'm not sure. I didn't get a chance to test the both directions, but just something to note. And so after looking at this, I did take some in situ measurements, which means I stood with my arms length away from these and I measured about where my head would be 
using a moving mic method. So this is the estimated in-room response from the Clipple. And here is the left speaker when I measured it. And here was the right speaker. And here's both of them together. And if I look at those, that's a pretty good match. I'm actually surprised that it got it that well. So there's some maybe lessons to be learned there for even myself. Here's something that's interesting. Do you want to pull up your picture of your desk setup? All right. So this is how you had your setup. And so you can see the base module laying down. Also, you have two pretty big monitors behind them. I don't know how that affects things. And also yours is near a rear wall, whereas mine was at a desk that was in the center of the room. Mm -hmm. So they do have dip switches for that to account for it. But of course, there's some significant differences in those two setups. I don't know that EQ can, can fix the differences. So here's what's interesting. So here's the estimated in-room response. And here in this magenta color, this is your this is your main listening position response. Right. At a desk. And so right. here's mine again. And it's pretty different. Yeah. We have well, some and, different. And it's pretty different below about 500 hertz, which is kind of what we expect, right? So the the speaker is dominant and above 500 hertz, and the room is going to be more dominant, or the effects of the room and the desk and things like that are going to be more dominant below that. So, so that's yeah. interesting. What do we see here? So what I notice is, remember I said that there was a dip in the response? Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, I wonder if we see that. In mine, I was able to see that. Mm -hmm. right? I see that that dip just about like what it looked like in the in the anechoic data. So you remember how I was I had that other THX speaker yeah. in my uh, in my picture, right, and yeah. it was because it's both a concentric about the same size. I think about a four four and a half inch concentric driver, mm -hmm. and so that's how in purple is how it measures by itself. Okay, but when I put it on a desk on some stands, I was getting a dip here. So I kind of assumed like, oh, this is probably the desk yeah. that's causing this. And it's interesting because it coincides with where the dip was in the anechoic response too. So I was a little bit confused as to what was happening there, whether it was my desk that was causing it right, or it will, if it was inherent in the speaker, I, I was just wasn't sure. Mm -hmm. Or maybe, uh, maybe the desk is supposed to account for it, but my situation was undoing it. It was causing the dip. Maybe. Yeah. Yeah. I, I can't tell. Right. Yeah. So no, it's, that's an interesting one, but that, so that mono price, mm -hmm. um, that's the near, Oh, the, See, okay, off the that's desk. The near field. That's so, not at your desk, right? Yeah. This is off near field, not on my desk. Okay, there is right. no dip here. The okay, moment okay. I put it at this exact same desk in the same place, I get the dip. Yeah. That's really interesting. Yeah. I did do some listening tests. And so let's talk quickly about, prior to EQ for a second. Yeah. And so no EQ of my own, just whatever's built into the unit. I listened to it and I wanted to know, could I hear this? And so I just played test tones where I just went through and I just kept going back and forth up and down that scale. Right. And what it sounded like is almost sounded like a phase shift. Okay. Like yeah. I could still hear something, but the phase began to change. Yeah. That's, but, but I didn't hear like an audible lowering of volume. It's just, it kind of like got far, like something happened. Yeah. Right. That's yeah. what I experienced at that range. Yeah, I know what you're talking about. Um, and that's, that's actually something that I can relate to for bass. A lot of mm -hmm. the times when you're trying to get your bass aligned between your subwoofer and your mid bass, something like that, uh, mm -hmm. if they're not properly phase aligned, then you'll hear almost like a separating. If you've got the subwoofer over here and you know you got your towers next to it, you can almost hear the image go from right between the two maybe to spread mm -hmm. out and it's touching both of them. So what you're describing sounds very similar to that where it's it's like there's no more precision in that particular area. It's just gotten fatter. And what's interesting, this is where the crossover is around here, right? Yeah, like I think really high. Like, like 280. So the dip that I'm experiencing here that I can't tell whether it's because of my desk or it's, you know, has to do with this particular crossover. It's really tough to tell, but mine is happening right here around 471 hertz. So we were talking about where the crossover is. Callie says it's 
280 hertz, I believe, in their in their spec. What I did was I measured the base module separately and the coaxial separately, and then I just you know looked at where they crossed over it. Now, this is with the DSP applied. This is me going through the base module. It's not like I just somehow took the base module out of the uh, DSP box or something like that, and then I did the same thing with the with the satellite. But what we can see here is, yeah, it looks like crossover is somewhere in the ballpark of 300 hertz. And when you're doing measurements like this, if you're off by a little bit, that's fine. So I'm going to trust their spec at 280 hertz. What's crazy, though, is it's not <clears> – <throat> how steep is that slope? Uh, it's sealed, so it should be 12 dB per octave. Uh, this scale is crazy. I just realized that, but that's okay. Mm -hmm. I guess what I'm saying is it's still within that region where I was noticing a dip. Yeah. It's still in the in the ballpark there. Right. Yeah. Where they're crossing over. So can you point to where maybe 471 would be around there? 471 would be in this area. Okay, right up there. That's five. Okay. So mm, maybe maybe not. I don't know. Yeah. It's tough. I don't know what's causing it, right? Yeah, who knows? That's it. Man. Okay. Yeah. So I was talking about listening. And the other thing was this bump around a hundred ish hertz, hundred and thirty mm -hmm. around here. There's a bump. Mm -hmm. I could hear that. I, I could definitely hear that there oh, was. Okay. I could. Yeah, I definitely. I was could playing too. test tones, and I was like, "Well, oh, there's there's a little something there. There's yeah. a little extra." Well, like when I was listening, like male vocals sounded way too rich. Um, but then the other thing was, I noticed a lot of kick drums had too much boominess to them. Mm -hmm. So that was one of the first things I went and just draw. I knew it was around 120 hertz. So I just dropped that down like 5 dB out the gate. I was playing test tones through this to try to get an idea of where what was happening during the crossover. In the crossover region, could I hear that transition? Because for most satellite sub satellite base module, whatever you want to call it, 80 hertz is the typical range. Yeah. And for this, it's much higher, and it's similar to. I don't want. I'm not saying these are the same, but I reviewed a the base or uh, Bose Acoustimass, and it had a satellite and base module, and they also crossed it over very high. And the integration was actually pretty decent in the room. You know, mm -hmm. when if I measured them, there's a huge hole there, and so yeah, I wanted to see if it was audible the transition between the satellite speakers and the base module. I wanted to see if it was audible. And so I played just a simple sweep. And what I noticed was when it went from the base, it started in that middle and then it would go out. This is the shape. Oh yeah. Yeah. yeah it like, it did like a little mustache, right? Started in the middle and then it just would go out like that. And I'm like, Whoa, that was, that was a weird, I've never experienced that. And of course, if you had two bookshelf speakers, it wouldn't make that sound. It mm. would just all come from the two. If I had some Cali Audio LP6 V2s, they'd all just come from each speaker. Mm -hmm. right? Or if you, you're talking about the imaging, maybe it'd be somewhere in the middle. But right. it wouldn't do this shape. Yeah. So what was your experience? Did you have that? So, uh, well, two things I want to note then, and and it kind of gets back to that the crossover region that they're saying it's two, 280 hertz. I, I, a lot of people, when I posted that I was going to be reviewing this speaker set, a lot of people said, I'm very interested to see what you think about that crossover point because it seems way too high. And yeah, on the, on the surface, I get it. And it sounds like maybe that's some of what you were noticing as well. Uh, but with that as kind of my, my taking off point, I'll say these two things. One, I noticed that when I set the thing up improperly, that it created what we call like a horseshoe soundstage, where basically what I'd done was I'd put the mid or the base module against my wall behind my monitors, but I kept the satellite speakers closer to me. Well, number one, you're not supposed to do it that way because Cali says, don't do it that way. That's why they had this, this cut sheet. They tell you how to set it up. I didn't follow that. I thought I was being smarter than them. I wasn't. And, and when I did that, basically all the lower vocals were going straight to that, that base module. So everything sounded like it was coming out from the base module on the lower frequencies, but on the higher frequencies, it was coming out for me. Or a little bit closer from me and that just was weird so when i went back and set it up the way i was supposed to set it up i didn't have that issue anymore um maybe akin to what you're saying but it's actually the opposite of is what i found where i actually liked that the vocals were coming from 
the base bin. So 280 hertz yeah. seems pretty high, but I actually liked it. So every like the male vocals were coming from the center. They were locked in place. There was no wandering that I noticed in the crossover region. And I just genuinely liked that particular sound. I don't know that I would like it for a stereo setup uh, where you can play some far and wide, but near field when they're close together like that, I think I, that was to me almost a benefit, you know, not, not a detriment. I, I mean, I didn't hate it. I just was, it's weird. Wasn't used to it. I just wasn't yeah. used to, uh, you know, mid range, uh, phantom image, mid range, uh, you know what I mean? Yeah. There, uh, that's the best I way I could explain it. Like right. I wasn't expecting that. Like, it's just weird. It's a, it's a, it's a weird phenomenon. I didn't hate it either. So I thought I, it was very interesting. I'm like, Oh, it sounds like very like, it, first of all, the system sounds bigger than what it looks like. Yeah. When you see it, it sounds like, Whoa, wow. I mean, the, the base module is not small. That's the, yeah. It's not a tiny base module. It's pretty decent sized. I, um, I you heard what I didn't hear because of that dip in that 400 hertz region. And mm -hmm. based off of my experience and seeing that data, I think you had some kind of phase anomaly going on there. And that's what caused things to get fat and do that weirdness, right? But if you go back mm -hmm. and look at my in situ measurements from my seat, mm -hmm. I didn't have that mm -hmm. dip. So that's probably why I didn't hear that same thing. All right. So here's you not sitting in the seat. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to remember if I was sitting in the seat. No, I was standing behind it. Okay. Taking the measurement. But with yours in the seat. You see it? You see it? Yeah. Different, huh? Uh, yeah. You are also having that. Yeah. So I've never gotten to the point where I feel comfortable saying that you have to make the measurements in the seat or out of the seat. Um, mm -hmm. I used to play around with that in car audio all the time, and I just never got to a point where I felt like I had a definite answer one way or the other. Mm -hmm. So I, I saw that video before. the time now and just kind of compare and say, ah, eh, it's kind of close. But these these are, that's just very different from from these two. Yeah. Like, there, there is, you do have a measurement where it did what mine did. Right. And also what's interesting is that estimated in room, it's not the exact same place, but kind of sees, you know, shows something there. I want to say thanks to Aaron for doing this. I appreciate everything you do. You go way out of your way to do these measurements. And you're also a good friend. So thank you. I appreciate that. So that's it for this one. If you liked the video, make sure to like, subscribe, ring the bell to be notified when I upload new videos. That's it. Take care. Bye-bye.